Yeah, we see the Earth from here. And I have seen Friday, Saturday, and now Sunday, no exaggeration myself, 200 helicopters, black helicopters, army helicopters, private helicopters flying all over Austin, Texas. And guess who's here in town? It's the uh, Bilderberg Group. Yeah, that's, that's who they are. Um, the globalists like to meet at Bilderberg once a year for a two-day powwow. But they get a lot of business done at Formula One races. They get a lot of business done at Bohemian Grove. And they get a lot of business done at their sub-regional groups, uh, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, uh, things like the Bilderberg Group. Uh, again, are centrally only have about 130 members, but then they'll have things like the CFR over the United States and its counterpart, the Royal Institute of International Affairs uh, in England. And they have similar roundtable groups in each country. But when you have a Formula One race, it is the sport of kings. And I was reading the local paper, uh, the bigwigs that are here. I was reading uh, one guy wasn't allowed to... Um, rent out a famous cattleman's hotel here in Austin, Texas. Uh, he tried for about a year uh, ahead of time to be able to rent it out for the three days of Formula One. So he just bought it so that he could rent it. They said, no, you can't pay double, you can't pay triple, you can't pay any amount, no, and he just bought it. Now, that wouldn't be a problem if most of these guys had made their money uh, writing a book, creating a computer program, uh, making a film, uh, creating an invention. But when you look at who goes to Formula One, the globalists, the new ruling elite, it's fractional reserve, money changing, bankers. And then they get us to pay for it as well. They get us, we the people, to pay to build the tracks, to build the sports stadiums, uh, and then they get 10-year tax exemption. And then they get the Texas State National Guard called up by the governor to condition everybody with troops on the streets. And uh, that, all that gets paid for. And taxpayers pay for the DPS and the rest of it. And Euro trash crawling up and down. Uh, South Congress, you name it, jumping out of their limos, running into the Justin Boots place, grabbing things hand over fist. And I'm paying for it. The ruling class made their money through fraud. Uh, I was thinking of Bernie Madoff today and, uh, you know, what a scammer he was, but he was small fry compared to a lot of these guys. And lo and behold, not only did his son commit suicide, if you believe that, yeah, with cement shoes, I'm sure, but now the ch uh, chief uh, accountant who was magically handling all these hundreds of billions of missing dollars, uh, he blew his head off if, in New Jersey, if you believe that. Uh, you probably also believe that there's no corrupt judges that get paid off either. You probably believe that uh, that the uh, government loves you and wants to take good care of you. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on this today. I'm going to get into the huge developments in Israel with Gaza and with Syria uh, and with Egypt. Uh, there's, there's shots being fired at all three countries back and forth. Uh, and we're going to get into Ron Paul's speech. We'll play most of it. Uh, in the second hour today. I was going to play all of it today, but that took about an hour and a half of total airtime because it's about 50 minutes long, just shy of that. So I'm going to air large portions of it, most of it, uh, in the second hour today with moderate uh, amounts of commentary from yours truly. Uh, but we're going to break down the fact that the election happened. They started imploding the economy like clockwork to then hold us hostage and say, give us new taxes or things will get a lot worse. And then the new taxes are given to the globalist and then things get worse. And they say, give us more money or things will get worse. And uh, we're going to look at uh, what's happening also with the bottom dropping out with all these new wars uh, starting up. I mean, the, the wars against Iran began years ago and the wars against Syria and, and, and uh, all these other countries. Uh, but now it's going into a much higher gear, a hot war. We'll be looking at that. It's certainly a crazy time. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Sunday, the 18th day of November, 2012. I am your host, Alex Jones, and we are going to be here live, as we are every Sunday, 4 to 6 Central, 5 to 7 Eastern. Okay, wow, there is so much to cover here. Um, I'm going to air large excerpts of Ron Paul's farewell speech that has really gotten a lot of attention, and even in mainstream media, because he lays out what an incredible tyranny 
this country is turning into and how fast the acceleration of corruption and decadence and evil by government uh, is, is moving. There is a huge acceleration, and it sounds like a speech Alex Jones would give, yours truly. He calls them authoritarian psychopaths. He talks about a premeditated takeover. Uh, he talks about how we will be imprisoned and how we will be enslaved. You know, Ron Paul's very smart, and uh, he studied a lot of history, so have I. He's been in Congress off and on for 30 years. He knows and so do other statesmen, so do other historians. This is, a, this is a fact. We know the path we're going down uh, is designed to bankrupt us and turn us into financial slaves. And in the last segment of this hour, before we go to the second hour and come back with a Ron Paul speech, and I'll, I'll be here live as well uh, with limited commentary in and out of the breaks playing it. So I'll be here live uh, next hour playing that Ron Paul speech. And if you've missed, missed it or haven't heard it, call your friends and family, tell them to tune in. It is extremely powerful. And I'm going to create a bibliography of the speech in the next few weeks, documenting every statement he made. And I'm going to put it to video with John Bound, who's going to work on it with me. John Bound out there on Sunday running the board, doing a great job with Dan Badandi and the rest of the Sunday crew. So we're going to, uh, you know, really uh, enshrine this Ron Paul speech because it's extremely powerful and extremely cogent and for 49 minutes lays it all out. So that is coming up. Uh, but before this hour ends, uh, we sent our reporters out yesterday and today and they have a video audio report we're going to file here on air. Jakari Jackson and um, Marcos Morales with uh, troops on the streets uh, here in Austin and outside Austin for the Formula One race. Uh, and Formula One is the sport of kings. The new kings are foreign, money-changing, money-manipulating, Ponzi scheme uh, kings. And that's who's here. Uh, and I've watched their helicopters anytime you walk outside. As I walked in today, two of them flew over. I mean, it's, you walk outside for an hour, you'll see 50 helicopters. Because these people don't drive limousines uh, to hotels full of hookers. They don't drive limousines to the mall. They, they, they land helicopters at helipads they've set up everywhere, all over the city. And helicopters land, and they get off with prostitutes and go into stores or go into a Starbucks. And the police sit there and block the road for them because they're God. Uh, and again, my issue is I'm not into class envy. I'm all for... You being wealthy and making your money with an invention, um, with uh, research, with a book you write, uh, with a skill you have, I absolutely admire people like that. These globalists who created 1.5 quadrillion in fraudulent derivatives garbage in the last 15 years have gotten our government, the European governments as well, to sign on to their debt. And the prostitute media, the prostitute Decepticon media, uh, these con artists go along with this. I mean, did you know when you do a local bond, almost in every case it gets invested in some big slush fund and they, they, they then go out and resell it over and over again and repackage it 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. They found some derivatives repackaged, resold 120 plus times. Okay? Now, our debt's 15 trill. We're told we're bankrupt because of the derivatives that the U.S. two years ago, Washington Post estimated $644 trillion. Look, I don't owe the $644 trillion, okay? And that's a fraud, and these guys created it. They didn't screw up creating these derivatives. No. They designed this, and they've written about how they designed it, and now they say they want $100 trillion. In fact, guys, print me AP or London Telegraph from last year's Davos, which is where these Bilderberg scum meet. F1's one of their other big meeting places because they can use it as a cover when they're here engaged in all the different activities and their parties and the rest of it. Oh, we were here for F1. I mean, this is in the news. that Global mafias come into town. Just every form of trash. And uh, it's even better. I get to pay for it as a taxpayer. I get to pay a franchise tax, a state franchise tax, that part of it's given to the city of Austin, and they've got all these sales taxes, and they've got property taxes that goes to pay for the racetrack, and the, and, and, and the gangsters get a tax exemption. 
I mean, go look at any of the big F1 chiefs. Just go look at them, the courts, the indictments, the, the deaths, the murders, the, oh, oh, you know, the oh, here's a billion to this daughter, three billion to that daughter. I mean, no wonder. It's a joke. And you got a brain-dead public with IQs at room temperature who don't even know what planet they're on. And these globalists are financing the takeover of the entire criminal justice system, the courts, the whole society, and converting it to an injustice system to oppress us that are aware of their activities. And let me tell you out there, middle class, they're going to take your house, they're going to take your pension funds, they're going to take it all. And you're going to sit there and thank them for it because you like to read the newspaper and feel like you're part of the power structure. You like to... Um, you like to watch the financial news and think you're getting you know, a lot of news on CNBC. Uh, you like to think you're real smart. Oh, but the yuppies that run the criminal syndicate uh, here in Austin for the globalists were a model UN city for the carbon taxes they put in, shutting down the, the power plants, you name it here. Uh, they're all exempt, though, when we get the rolling blackouts because of it, the central district and the, uh, the, uh, the government buildings here. We are the model city for the UN in the United States. We are the model of uh, criminal government. All the yuppie scum got real mad when the helicopters were renting vacant lots in downtown and landing next to their houses. I mean, I mean, they're, they're lifting off and taking off every few minutes. There's like 50 helicopters at any one time. I love it. Now the Euro trash that came in and bought the city and, and, and bought the taxpayer money for nothing, now they're going to be landing helicopters 24-7 forever in the yuppie scum's yards downtown. <laughs> oh, but the yuppie scum got mad. The yuppie scum just passed an ordinance saying you're not allowed to land your helicopters downtown. You watch. That ordinance is going to get overturned. They wouldn't rent the old Cattleman Hotel. I'm not going to say the name. I have this inside baseball to one of the F1 guys. They wouldn't rent it to him for three days, so he just bought the whole thing. And you watch. They're going to crack the whip, and the city is going to lick their boot up one side and down the other. But the yuppies didn't like watching all the number 10 trophy wives and the trophy mistresses packing in and off those helicopters, not from the airport out to F1. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. They're flying them around if they want to go get a hamburger. <laughs> and of course, you know, all these make-believe elitist nobody uh, that run the local crime syndicate, you know, they like going down to the, they like going to the hotels and the steakhouses and feeling like they're the biggest guy in town. They don't like seeing multi-billionaires that have trillions in leverage fraud money. They're really trillionaires, but it's all fraudulent. Don't worry, we've been signed on to it by, by, by the criminal class. See, the low-level criminal class that thinks they're the biggest game in town, woo lordy, they don't like seeing Euro trash. They're bosses. Okay, I, you know what? I'm already covering F1, aren't I? But I thought later I'd show you some of the uh, news articles where Ecclestone uh, gave uh, $3 billion to one of his daughters this year as a gift. Yeah, oh, here, here, baby. And she's got the biggest mansion in the U.S., out in California. And then her sister's got the second biggest mansion, which, by the way, you paid for it. All over the world, governments paid for the tracks and gave them tax exemption. You paid for it, schmucks. I paid for it. I'm a, but at least I know I'm getting raped. You know what I mean? So all that trash it right now is out there at their stupid race. Uh, it's all real funny, and now all the sucker, yuppie, city council class, local governing class, you're all just going to get shoved aside because the globalists are taking Austin over. And you're going to have to sit there with your trophy wife when she's shoved aside, standing in the line at the bar, not getting in. <laughs> Go drink some fluoride, you scumbag city council. All right, we're going to come back and tell you about the giant rollout of a new huge war, Israel-Gaza. Shelling going back between Israel and Egypt. Missiles coming out of uh, 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 Egypt. Uh, it's, it's all going down. We're going to break it down straight ahead. Yeah, the uh, globalists are in my city right now. In fact, they say more mega bankers, more hedge fund hyenas, more vulture scammers go to uh, F1 racing than any other event. And that for days before and days after, they come in and have their political meetings. In fact, a lot of times, you know, there'll, there'll be mysterious murders and things that go on. Uh, kind of like, uh, well, one of these guys, uh, the founder of NASDAQ, Bernie Madoff, you may have heard of him, uh, you know, his son committed suicide. Yeah, sure. 
Uh -huh. And uh, there are big oceans in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Those aren't mirages. And now his accountant blew his head off over the weekend. He's committed suicide. The New Jersey police said that. And again, if you believe that, I got a bridge I'm ready to sell you on the moon. But here it is, London Telegraph. World needs 100 trillion more credits, says World Economic Forum. Uh, it's the London Telegraph. And uh, they say they want it through carbon taxes. And they say they uh, want it not just from carbon taxes, uh, right here in this article, but they want it from VAT. And what is Obama getting ready to propose? Bloomberg AP are reporting. Oh, uh, trillions more in taxes uh, to pay foreign banks, to pay off their derivatives that our government signed on to. That's not our debt. So they can fly around until 3 a.m. in the morning where I live visiting uh, different prostitutes. Until 2, 3 in the morning, 50 helicopters in the air. <laughs> Folks, you can't have, if you had a bar on 6th Street in the bar district, you can't have your music on anymore because, because the city's so tyrannical, you can't have music that's loud in, in the rock and roll district. But if you want to land helicopters everywhere you can, I'm sorry, I've got world news to cover. It's just having the scum here. I mean, I'm walking in, there's helicopters everywhere, and John Bowne goes, how is it having the globalists flying over? And I'm like, yeah, it's really irritating. It's one thing to go to Bilderberg or cover Davos. We send reporters to that. We're going to send more. Now, I mean, they've taken over my city. It just makes me want to throw up. Because these are the guys lobbying to have police states. These are the guys that laugh, like Ben Affleck saying, "Oh, I think I love the TSA quote grabbing people's bleep on Bill Maher when he when he's been you know flies in a private jet." These are the people. At least at least he made his money in in, in, in you know as an actor. The globalists made their money stealing mine in almost every case, and then they're the ones setting a police state up so they're safe from me when everything goes to hell in a handbasket. See, when criminals take over, they want a tyranny in place so they can get away with it. And now let me move to our top stories. As you know, if you're a listener or if you follow the news, last Thursday, I called for the second American Revolution to begin. And I said it is a peaceful, nonviolent, through the Declaration of Independence, the states have to pull out and then announced that they are using the secession power that's in the Declaration of Independence, in the Constitution, in the Bill of Rights, in the 10th and 9th Amendment, folks, read them, to pull out of the hijacked federal government. And I have articles right here in my stack where the globalists brag. In fact, we'll put some of these on screen. Just put the headline in, Bankers brag they've conquered the U.S. and Europe. And it's full of dozens and dozens and dozens of links to world leaders on video and our own leaders saying we've been conquered by foreign banks and they run things. So the federal government's been conquered. What is our redress? The states created the federal government. The states, just like mommy and daddy have the child, the child's being bad, you ground them, you spank them, you discipline them. Again, bankers declare U.S. and Europe conquered, world government now an open secret. With countless video links to the head of the EU saying it, the head of the EU central bank that's part of the Federal Reserve, CNBC admits we're all slaves to central bankers. I can play these clips again. In fact, later in the week, I want to do another report where we just show dozens of clips of them saying it. Because it's one thing to have an article. I want to put all the clips together, guys, and uh, maybe even for like the Tuesday radio show, so people can hear maybe 30 minutes of New World Order clips. I know on one of those hard drives, we've got over 200. 200 world leaders saying we're under world government, get used to it. And it's world government where, where fraudsters, Ponzi scheme operators, create thousands of trillions of fake garbage, more than all the wealth in the world, many times over, and then get everybody to sign on to it. Because the governments can be bought, these politicians, for a couple hundred thousand locally, a million federally a lot of times. I mean, you look at the amounts of money, it's, and they're like, here, I'll give you some of this fake stuff. Here, I'll give you some of this you know, thin air. Oh, yes, sir, I want that. But see, because the Ponzi scheme guys are in control, that thin air is taken as real. They have an Aladdin's lamp. And they're eugenicists who want to take over the world through fraud and then reduce your population numbers so they can have the world to themselves. I mean, that's their ideology. That's what they believe in. And so all this is going on, uh, and I'm calling for really getting serious because you're not going to polish a giant pile of stinking New World Order dragon manure that is... The, 
the hijacked, captured. I'm, those aren't terms. Those aren't just embellishments to to be used as hyperbole, as some type of uh, fancy nomenclature, uh, to tickle your ears, uh, to over-describe something. They brag, we've been concord. They brag, they brag. So you take that to grand juries, you take that to your city councils, you take that to your county commissioners, you take that to your state houses, so that the general population knows as Paul Revere did, to arms to arms, the Redcoats are coming. To arms to arms, the British are coming. And who were the British? The big mercantile, fractional reserve banking, uh, money manipulating, derivatives creating. Modern derivatives were first used over 200 years ago in England and then banned for a long time. Because it's not just where a mega bank can have one dollar or one pound or one shilling or one franc or one shekel or one ruble or one yawn or one yen on deposit and loan 10 out that's generally the rule bankers like to keep if, if you don't want to go like mexico or other countries that have weimar type hyperinflation zimbabwe currently you know where it takes a trillion dollars uh, zimbabwe and to buy a piece of bread literally in some cases it got to like 40 trillion or something to buy a piece of bread or a sandwich so so that's the issue that we're talking about this is what we're dealing with uh, here today, ladies and gentlemen. And that's who runs us, and that's why all this is happening. That's why we're going into a police state. That's why the globalists are above the law. Uh, you look at the big mega banks that launder the money and create the derivatives and all this. They're the ones running the narcotics. They get caught and don't get in trouble. Oh, Wells Fargo, you got caught laundering uh, $378 billion or $376 billion. Uh, AP, Reuters, you name it. Oh, you're not in trouble. Oh, you want to pay a hundred million dollar fine here? Oh, oh, you mean I? You you mean I'm walking out of the bank with uh, with hundreds of billions, and I got to give you a hundred million? I mean, that's like you mean I'm stealing a million? I got to give you five thousand? Okay, I guess so. You showed me not even a slap on the hand. It's like a nickel tip to the bankers, uh, minions, the the, the uh, government, because they know the public's so stupid. One hundred and ten million sounds like a lot of money. That was the actual number. And, and, and I mean, they, and they were running the aircraft along with Wachovia and, and everything. The air, the military bases, national security. All national security is, is a license to kill, steal, and destroy. Giant underground bases, huge air bases. And the military's been caught hundreds of times shipping in drugs. Now they fly kids in and out. They have contractors that do it. Your kid gets grabbed out of the backyard, they're on a flight to Saudi Arabia. You better hope the crown prince. You know what? I'm going to come right back, ladies and gentlemen. Stay with us. All that scum's here in town, too. Now that I've broken down who we're dealing with and who runs our country and our world through fraud, now that I've put out the fact that I'm calling for the states to pull out of the corrupt federal government because it's illegitimate and reconstituted, and I'm going to talk about that more in the next hour when I play excerpts of Ron Paul's farewell speech, I want to make it clear, I'm not saying you're bad if you like an NFL football game. I just shouldn't have to pay for the sports stadium. I'm not saying you're bad if you like F1 racing. I personally like all sorts of race car stuff. NASCAR, F1, funny cars, top fuel, monster trucks. It's I like vehicles. I'm, I mean, I'm Americana. Who doesn't like vehicles? Um, I don't like paying for it. And I don't like that this is the most elitist sport there is. And when I was got cut off by the break, I was bringing up the Saudi royal family. Um, you know, they're busily funding so many of the Al Qaeda groups. This is in L.A. Times, AP, Reuters, pull it up. I show it all the time, Washington Post. That's who's being used via NATO to attack Libya and now Syria and now all these other areas to get rid of Assad. Assad was not offensively causing any trouble. Al Qaeda is literally a hundred times worse than Assad. And now Hillary says we need to invade Syria last week because Al-Qaeda is there. I mean, that is incredible. And of course they lied when they said that the, the Benghazi attack on the ambassador was a protest. Of course they knew it was Al-Qaeda. That's who they put in charge in Benghazi. That's the first city they took over two years ago as a base to take over the rest of Libya. They used Al-Qaeda forces out of Saudi Arabia and Egypt over the border from the east into the eastern city of Benghazi to take over the rest of the North African country. And they're still lining people up and murdering them and doing purges over there of uh, Alawite Muslims, of Shiite Muslims, uh, of Christians, and of blacks mainly.
and I mean, the blacks can't be in Africa, where can they be? So the point is, all of this is going on, it's totally immoral, and the system can only get away with it because the public is disconnected from reality. And we had all better hope that, you know, one day the king of Saudi Arabia or the crown prince doesn't wake up and, you know, decide to launch a big war with Iran, because that's what they're pushing for. And that's where we go to next. And I'll get more into my calls for revolution. It's, it's time if you want it. They have cultural revolutions. They have economic revolutions. They have religious revolutions. They have uh, velvet uh, revolutions of, of uh, uh, modern renaissance. That's what I'm calling for. But... You've got to get out of the system. You've got to say no. Uh, look, you build it, they come. NBC, CBS, ABC, Huffington Post, DrudgeReport.com, uh, Alabama, uh, Missouri TV stations. I've got a giant stack here. I mean, it's a big stack of two days of news with people picking up the fact that we've called for folks to videotape the TSA this next week starting Monday. Uh, th uh, for the next seven days and to opt out of the body scanners, which they have now admitted in major studies, pull them up, cause cancer. We're going to add some more flyers up tomorrow with excerpts of the news and scientists where they talk about it causing cancer. Uh, not just the old machines, the new machines. And the TSA admits it's legal and lawful to film them. You just can't interfere with what they're doing. So we're going to let them know we're the boss. That is a revolution of standing back up and demanding our rights. It is so elementary, it is so simple, that if you act like a slave, if you act compliantly and you act like a criminal, which the system's trying to train you to do, then you will go into slavery. That's what all this is about. Now, I want to get into the top information, obviously, and the reason I haven't gotten into it for 37 minutes of airtime is because I don't even know how to address this. It's so huge. It's so big. It's so daunting. Uh, and it's so disgusting to see it happening, and it's such a complex issue that when this heated up last Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we've we've posted articles on it from different perspectives. Uh, I've researched it, and I, as best I can tell, uh, I'm now going to break down what's happening in the Middle East currently. But to understand what's happening between Israel and Gaza to its southwest to Egypt and that that zone with the Palestinians, you have to understand what's happening to the north in Lebanon and then Syria and the Golan Heights. You have to know what's going on with the Muslim Brotherhood that the West has helped put in power in Egypt and in Tunisia and in Libya uh, and that they're trying to install in Syria. And you have to understand that the Palestinian leader, both the military leader that was killed and the current uh, non-military leader, are members of the Muslim Brotherhood. And so you have to have the background of this. Why would NATO and Obama and Saudi Arabia back when Saudi Arabia is supposedly allies with Israel? Don't think about this like Ford, Chevy, Dallas Cowboys, Washington Redskins, rah, rah, which side you're on, Palestinian, I Israeli. Pull back like a globalist who wants chaos, who wants crises, who wants division, who wants to get countries into more debt. You want more chaos. That's what you get power out of. That's what you can then direct things out of. That's what you can use as a political distraction. So shutting down which side you root for, and obviously most people in the polls show this, the polls have flipped the last decade, Watching Israel with all this incredible firepower, uh, you know, going after folks throwing rocks at their tanks, uh, public opinion worldwide is flipped against Israel. And you add to all of this that coming up next week, the UN's going to look at recognizing the Palestinians uh, and calling to basically put UN troops in, whether Israel likes it or not. That's biblical type stuff, which we don't even get into, but things are really getting crazy. You look at all that going on, and so there's always off and on rockets coming in out of Gaza. I'm not saying that's a good thing. It's bad. I, I don't think the Palestinians should be doing that. Rockets coming in out of Lebanon. That's been heating up the last few months. From, so from the north and the southwest, you got rockets coming into Israel, which is tiny. It's, I mean, it's, it's teeny tiny. So you can drive across it in a few hours. So all this is going on. Uh, Obama's now been elected, so they don't, uh, you know, a, a new wider war won't won't mess up his election. Israel wants to take out Syria so they can go up against Iran, their biggest ally, Iran's biggest ally is Syria. 
See, see, the real world, folks, is complex. So I'm giving you some of the background here. So, so here's some of the pieces. Also, something happened last Tuesday, and this is in Haritz newspaper, Haritz, however you pronounce it, the Jerusalem Post, and a bunch of other publications. Uh, you can just type in, uh, killed Palestinian leader had peace deal. And it goes over uh, that, again, in Haratz and, and, and other papers. The real reason assault in Gaza, why Israel is escalating the assault on Gaza in November. You've got the U.N. Uh, agreement coming up next week to recognize uh, the Palestinians uh, as a non-member observer state, but that's still part of the U.N., so they're going to recognize them as a state. Just like China doesn't want Taiwan recognized. And that fight always goes back and forth. So, so that's going on. No matter which side you're on, Taiwanese or Chinese, you know, the issue is that's a big contentious issue. So Israeli peace activist Hamas leader Jabari killed amid talks on long-term truce. And there is that Haaretz uh, headline for you. Uh, if you're watching on PrisonPlanet.tv, people get confused listening on the radio. I try to give you verbal cues to go find where I got it. If you're a radio listener, to go see it for yourself. And for TV viewers, you can just sit back and see it for yourself. Uh, so the Huffington Post also has articles on that. So that's part of what's going on here. What is it? Four Israelis killed now? And, and that is not a good thing. But, I mean, more people die a day in Israel in car accidents from that. I looked up the numbers. It's like seven a day on average. Uh, die a day uh, comparatively from what's happened here. So Israel's certainly using this as a reason to go in. They've been using high-tech weapons, 300-plus uh, attacks or sorties, uh, into the country since last Wednesday. Uh, they are blowing up all the major government infrastructure, what looks like preparation for an invasion. And again, Jerusalem Post, Haratz, uh, and the Times of London, the Sunday Times today, uh, are all saying that... Uh, Israel is admittedly massing tanks and weapons and uh, 80,000 troops to invade Gaza. And I guess basically right around to the streets blowing everything up because that's what they're going to do. They certainly wouldn't dare go inside the buildings. Uh, so when we come back, I'm going to finish up with what I really, well, not what I believe, I know what's behind this. I'm just wondering how it's going to unfold, but this could easily turn into a wider war that could lead to the Third World War. And a lot of financial, military, uh, and governmental experts are saying the same thing. So 2012 could end with a bang. By the way, I'm going to get former top CIA analyst Ronald Reagan and George Bush Sr., Ray McGovern, on this week about the Gaza situation. He's been there many times. He's a top expert. I'm going to get you know, Colonel Anthony Schaefer on, who ran the unit that was able to uh, target bin Laden twice, but was ordered not to kill him in 2001. I want his take on it, so I'm just calling out here live on air what I want the producers to set up. We're going to be breaking this down in great detail, uh, where I've got three hours tomorrow. Uh, but also, what secession means. Not secession to form our own new country. The federal government's been taken over. We have to secede. The states have to pull out and say, we have the power to pull out. You're illegitimate. We want the private Federal Reserve out of here. We want the banksters out of here. We want the New World Order out of here because they've set up a financial system. They want us in debt that's impossible to pay back. The entitlements are just the way to blame us. And entitlements are bad. The welfare is bad because it makes people dependent and creates a dependent class that will vote to take the middle class's money and give 90% of it to foreign banks, 10% as a payoff to the low-level folks that pull the lever in the voting booth to take my guns, to raise my property taxes. Do you understand how that works? The ultra-rich have always employed the poor to vote to take the people's rights. Happened in ancient Greece. I love that series, Rome. I don't watch a lot of television, but they had two series years ago, four or five years ago, Rome, because it was so accurate. I've probably read 50 books or more uh, on uh, Rome and Roman history, and that, that's true. They would go and pay off the poor Romans uh, with bread and circus. They literally gave them bread and a few pieces of silver a month uh, and gave them free games. If they would vote out the patrician class that was conservative, that had built the empire, that wasn't corrupt. You know, the Romans would execute you if you cheated on your wife uh, when they first founded the Republic. Because Rome had come out of these decadent kings and, uh, I mean, it was wild, the proto-Romans. They weren't putting up with it. 
and then they became all decadent. Same story that we're going through again. You know, by the end of it, people were marrying their sisters and brothers and marrying their horses and declaring themselves God by the Caligula Nero, you know, type situation in the hundred years after Christ. All that degeneration happened over 250 years. And how old's America? 235. We are right at the point that no country, no empire has ever gone past this. Nobody. 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 And we look just like decadent Rome. And now decadent Rome says, you know, it's not the corrupt bankers. It's not the globalists that are the problem. It's Alex Jones. He says corrupt megabanks run us and there's going to be a world government. And I'm like, well, here's... Here's the Times of London, AP, Time Magazine, CNBC. I mean, I've had Nightline here going, you're a kook. You think there's a world government run by banks. And I go over to a computer and I go, well, here's all these world leaders saying it. Here's the Davos minutes. They're talking about a different world government than you, Alex. They play these mind games. They talk to me like I'm the general public and dumbed down. Folks, you don't have to be idiots. You don't have to be bamboozled. You can get as informed about the new world order as you are about other issues. I want to briefly get into Formula One again because we have a report on it. And it's the, it's, the, it's the group. They're here where I live now. They've come to me. And, of course, I'm paying for their, for their, for their event, a little crime syndicate meeting. All the race cars are just the background. But you look at what's happening. This is what's happening in Israel and with Hamas and Hezbollah and all the rest of it. There's no doubt that the West is putting radical Muslims in everywhere. So they can blow them up later. I said a year and a half ago when they killed Gaddafi, or when they started the invasion, before they killed Gaddafi, I said, you watch. Within two years, they'll be bombing all over Africa saying they're fighting Al-Qaeda. They're, they're already doing it. Didn't take a year and a half, two years. Within a year, they were doing it. We've got to have troops in Africa, in Libya, because of Al-Qaeda. The Al-Qaeda our government shipped in. Same ones they shipped in against the Russians, against the Serbs, against everybody else. And the TSA says they want to grope my family because of Al-Qaeda the government runs. They want to grope my family because the underwear bomber was put on the plane by the U.S. government. That came out on C-SPAN. I'm a weirdo. I watch C-SPAN. I read the Detroit Free Press when they were the only paper to report that the deputy head of the Secretary of State the Deputy Secretary of State said, yeah, the government ordered us to put him on the plane. I had a witness who saw him put him on the plane. Of course I knew. Our listeners are everywhere now. And remember that, criminals. Remember, we're watching you, too. So just because you got away with that, putting that drugged-up idiot on there, doesn't mean everybody doesn't know now. Who knows how to tie their shoelaces, what you did. So you're either awake or you're getting more and more dumbed down. I mean, it really comes down to that. But uh, what's happening in the Middle East, with hundreds and hundreds dying a day on the, uh, I mean, in one airstrike today, they killed 10 people, 10 civilians. Uh, that's being reported on in New York Daily News. And, and what they'll do is they'll report on one group of civilians killed and make that the headline, about 10, instead of the hundreds dead each day. Th that'll be a minor footnote. They'll say, oh, 10 dead in airstrike. And people then walk up and say, oh, look, 10 are dead today. That's a little game media plays. That's actually in a British psychological warfare manual they declassified about 15 years ago that I read. How they would do that, how if uh, there was a British force taking over an African country, they use the example, and they say, you say you kill a few thousand people. Say you killed a couple, or mention one of the killings as the big headline, and people will not even notice the larger number later. So see, once you've read psych warfare manuals that are public, I mean, you just see the tricks every day. The war propaganda. Oh, look, at least 10 dead civilians and possibly top of Mas rocket mastermind killed Israeli airstrike in deadliest day in one airstrike. In one airstrike. Of what, a, a, a hundred a day they've been doing the last three days? And again, even if you support Israel and think it's great they're blowing them up, you're being lied to. You're being manipulated. Tell us hundreds dead. Tell us hundreds dead. Don't sit there and, and play that game with me, okay? You see, that's what's so frustrating when you're awake as you see all this. What's happening? The West has put, kicked their dictator, Hazi Mubarak, out, put in radical Muslims in Egypt, put in radical actual al-Qaeda in Egypt, uh, backing up the Muslim Brotherhood, put in total al-Qaeda. That's where they fly al-Qaeda flags at the courthouses in Tripoli and all over uh, Libya now. Uh, Al-Qaeda's in full charge there, and they've got al-Qaeda that's taken about a third uh, of, and they're attacking from three directions, 
uh, there in Syria, north of Israel. So our government, let me say it again, is putting Al-Qaeda in, because it's not our government. It's not that our government's anti-Al-Qaeda pro-Israel or anti-Israel pro-Al-Qaeda or whatever. They're totally cold-blooded. They want huge wars, death and destruction for weapon sales, for distractions in the media, and to be able to take over society. That's what's going on here. That's what's happening. And they've got a big, major economic worldwide meltdown about to happen, part two. As I said they would do, once they got Obama and others in, now it's not an election issue. They can say, oh my gosh, we're going to go into total collapse, not just depression in Europe and here, if you don't give us unlimited money. And so that's what they're gearing us up to. They are, they are getting us ready now to be politically distracted with a big Iran war, a Syria falling first, uh, and terror attacks in Europe, maybe even here, uh, Israel in a larger war. And by the way, that's not just Alex Jones uh, saying that. I have a, a stack of articles here, and it's up at Infowars.com. Top economic advisors forecast world war. Washington's blog breaks it down. Kyle Bass, Larry Edelson, Jim Rogers, Mark Faber predict widespread war. And then it's got quotes from them all over the mainstream news saying when politicians are, are unpopular and when there's a depression, they always start a war. Yeah, World War I, World War II, the list goes on and on. And it goes on to say... Trade wars always lead to wars. A continuation of bailouts in Europe could ultimately spark another world war, says Senator National Investor Jim Rogers. Mark Fomber, the next thing the government will do is distract the attention of the people on bad economic conditions if they'll start a war somewhere. If the global economy doesn't recover, usually people go to war. That's Rogers. It goes on and on. And I've got military brass saying the same thing. I've got Politico saying it. Yeah, notice how suddenly Obama gets elected, the economy falls apart, and they say, oh, that's because people don't like Obama and they're afraid he's going to take jobs and it's too expensive. And that's, that, that's part of it. But mainly it's because now the globalists don't even need to make money off a of business. They just get trillions more out of banker bailouts when they threaten to implode the economy because they control it if you don't give them unlimited money from the taxpayer. And they, and they can make that money up as derivatives. But they want to depress the taxpayer so you lose your farm, your home, your business, so they can come in with their fiat currency, with their fiat dollars, they've got unlimited, and buy you up for pennies on the dollar. You see, it's not about the bailout. The bailout's about getting you deeper in debt to them. So when you bail them out, you go into debt to them. Do you understand how that works? And then you're bankrupt, so they come back in and take over. And that's why they want a wider war. And Israel doesn't want the Palestinians to be recognized next week. That's the facts. We'll be back. All right, we're going to come back with large excerpts of Ron Paul's speech and then my brief commentary as we go out to break each time. Uh, and undoubtedly, guys, we haven't gotten a rebroadcast ready yet for, um, for um, Thanksgiving, but I think... I think we should air the whole thing uninterrupted, maybe even commercial free. I don't know if stations can do that, but I'm going to air a large part of it uh, coming up with my commentary. Let me just say this, though, in closing on the whole Israel situation, because it's very complex. Israel is not one group of people. Israel is a very diverse group uh, of people whether they're Ashkenazi, and there's many different groups there, or whether they're Sephardic Jews, you know, Mediterranean Jews, North African Jews, who genetically many of them are identical to the Arabs. There are subgroups within them all, and there's at least four different types of Zionism. So people, you know, over the years say, do you support Israel or not support Israel? And my issue is, that's like saying, why don't you like Barack Obama? Is it because you're a racist? It, 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 it's just so dumbed down. Israel has been set up. Okay, that's the issue. And why was it set up? It was not set up to give the Jewish people a homeland. It was set up to be a aircraft carrier in the Middle East. I mean, you'd be a liar if you didn't say that. And then it's a set piece to play off the different governments. And if you look at Egypt, I mean, why did our government put the radicals in there? See, 
People go, well, that's Obama. He's a Muslim. Oh, yeah, right. He's CIA, folks. It's because they want to get a clash of civilizations going between the two sides. You're like, yeah, but choose a side. It's like telling me, choose a side, Republican or Democrat. And I'm like, don't you understand? From different perspectives, it looks like one side or the other's right. But do you get that the grand game is about playing them off against each other? And they're like, but pick the Cowboys or the Redskins. And I'm like, listen, it's... Do you understand? The whole thing is rigged. And until you de-emotionalize it and pull back and look at it, you're not going to go anywhere. You know, whenever I have researchers on them, and it's, it was in congressional hearings that our government funded the Nazis along with the British government, people are like, oh, yeah, the Nazis are going to get me, Alex. We're sick of hearing that. No, it's our government funded the, the communist. It funded the fascist. It funded the radical Muslims because our government is the globalist government. It's the banksters. See, they're funding groups for the clash. They're playing the groups off against each other. The globalists are eugenicists. They are Luciferian Satanists. And you can go research the Rothschilds early on were involved funding Hitler. But some of the Rothschilds didn't escape France and got killed by the Nazis. That's on record. So these people conjure whatever is evil and, and 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 hey if they think hitler's taking over they do business with them if they think lenin's taking over they finance them you know to do it it's the same thing they just fund everything they're pure opportunist and i see the people that just absolutely hate israel it, it's their whole world they have no intellectual acumen they have no depth politically they just say oh you're either want to destroy israel or you're bad and I'm like, destroy Israel. No one's destroying Israel. They've got 800 nuclear weapons, probably. Conservatively, 400. Most estimates are over 800. Submarines, uh, uh, high-tech cruise missiles, ICBMs. That's intercontinental ballistic missile with MIRV reentry devices. You know what that is? Better look it up. So Israel's not going anywhere. And, and again, ladies and gentlemen, if Egypt or if Jordan, or if Syria, or if Lebanon didn't want to use those Palestinians as political set pieces, they would let them into their countries. You know, those Palestinians want to get out. They won't let them either. They won't let them either because it's all this political football that they use. I don't like what Israel's doing. I don't like carpet bombing of civilians. I didn't like it when our government did it in other cases, and I think it's terrible. And long term, well, I mean, the globalists did eugenics experiments against 100,000 Jewish kids in Israel. All right, I'm going to get to most of Ron Paul's 40 plus minute speech he gave. What on Tuesday, his farewell address that has made headlines across the world. It's up on the Drudge Report for an unprecedented, I think, five days. Never seen that before. Uh, so, really tells it like it is about our criminal, criminal government. We're going to play large excerpts of that. Uh, here in just a moment, of course, Ron Paul was on with us last week. He'll be on with us very soon again. And uh, I've been uh, talking to uh, his crew about uh, moves to get the states to checkmate the federal government that's been hijacked by the globalist. Whether you call it secession, whether you call it a new declaration of independence, whatever you want to call it, we've got to get serious with this out-of-control federal government run by foreign banks trying to wreck us. Now, in closing, on the subject of Israel, Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, Gaza to the southwest, uh, Lebanon to the north, Syria, They're, Israel's now exchanging fire with Syria, Turkey's firing into Syria, our government's put al-Qaeda in Syria to attack Syria. I mean, this is just absolutely off the charts. The UN was set to recognize the Palestinian state next week. Whether you're for the Palestinian state or against it, there's been rockets firing into Israel for a long time, and Israel bombs them with high-tech weapons. It's terrible. I pray for both sides. I want this to end. I want peace. And a lot of people on both sides want that as well. Okay? I, I'm neutral in this in that I understand there's a lot of factions involved. It's complex. But nobody likes watching a high-tech military bomb people basically in a giant concentration camp. Because the Egyptians, run by the Muslim Brotherhood that our government put in power with al-Qaeda, that our government's putting in all these countries, they won't let the Palestinians go into Egypt. The, the, the Jordanians won't take them. I've already talked about that. The Syrians won't take them. The Lebanese won't take them. So they're all just fenced in. The Israelis won't take them. They're all fenced in living in 
the Dark Ages, and they've got a top Israeli general saying in the news here, we're going to bring you back to the Stone Age. So you've got them firing 100 rockets a day, 100 the day before. It's about 100 rockets a day being fired into Israel. Uh, and you've got Israel bombing all over the place there as well, massing a giant ground invasion. Why would our government and NATO fund radical Muslims to be in charge of all these countries to then tell the, the Gazans, hey, start a war, we'll, uh, we'll be behind you? Because the globalists are financing Israel and the radical Muslims, and they want to get a war going as a political distraction, as Mark Faber and a bunch of other top broker firms People that have really know what's going on are saying this is a war to distract people from what's happening economically. And so that's what's happening. Every major war, all the different sides get financed by the same people who sit back and get rich off of it. And it's despicable and it's terrible. And then they can use the Al-Qaeda threat that our criminal government runs. You can't criticize me for saying... 9-11 was an inside job because the hijackers were trained at U.S. military bases. That's mainstream news. Just type in hijackers trained at U.S. military bases. You had the heads of different bases go, yeah, these guys were trained in our classes. I don't know what's going on, but our government was involved. Yes, they were involved. Criminal elements in the government, bare minimum, let those guys do that, and they were double agents. But the truth is there's criminal elements that just use those guys as decoys that day, and those planes were remote control. But that's a whole other issue. I've made five films on the subject, and I'm the guy that started the 9-11 Truth Movement. The point is now it's admitted our government has put al-Qaeda in Libya and Syria and is using them against Iran, that Shiite, while saying we should give our rights up because al-Qaeda is hiding under our bed. All right, enough from me. Uh, we're going to break here in about six minutes, but I'm going to start this now. Please listen to everything he's saying and write it down. And the transcript is up at Infowars.com. This is Ron Paul's farewell to Congress speech transcript. And it's extremely powerful. And it breaks down the long laundry list of crimes and corruption and immor immorality that has led us to the sorry state we're in today. And uh, the government is a reflection of us. Even, even if most of the blame goes on the globalist, we wouldn't have gotten to this point if we would have been involved and engaged. As Churchill once said, um, you know, a lot of people won't fight when they have a good chance of winning and defeating the tyranny. And still, a lot of people won't get involved or fight when they have a moderate chance. Or even as things get worse and worse, a really, you know, uh, slim chance. But it always gets down to the fact you go ahead and fight when you have almost no chance because it's better to die on your feet than on your knees. And ladies and gentlemen, it's time to admit we've gone under tyranny and it's now trying to take everything over. It's time to wake up to this and realize that none of the decadence on television is going to fulfill you. Only the truth is. All right, here's the start of Ron Paul's speech. We'll go to break and come back uh, with more of it. I think this is important enough to air large segments of it. Here it is. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, this may be the last time I speak on the House floor. At the end of the year, I'll leave Congress after 23 years in office over a 36-year period. My goals in 1976 were the same as they are today, promote peace and prosperity by a strict adherence to the principles of individual liberty. It was my opinion that the course of the U.S. embarked on in the latter part of the 20th century would bring us a major financial crisis and engulf us in a foreign policy that would overextend us and undermine our national security. To achieve these goals, I sought, the government would have had to shrink in size and scope, reduce spending, change the monetary system, and reject the unsustainable cost of policing the world and expanding the American empire. The problems seem to be overwhelming and impossible to solve, yet from my viewpoint, just following the constraints placed on the federal government by the Constitution would have been a good place to start. Just how much did I accomplish? In many ways, according to conventional wisdom, my off and on career in Congress from 1976 to 2012 accomplished very little. No name regulation, legislation, no name federal buildings or highways, thank goodness. In spite of my efforts, the government has grown exponentially, taxes remain excessive, and the prolific increase of incomprehensible regulations continues. Wars are constants, 
and pursued without congressional declaration. Deficits rise to the sky. Poverty is rampant and dependency on the federal government is now worse than any time in our history. All this with minimal concerns for the deficits and unfunded liabilities that common sense tells us cannot go on much longer. A grand but never mentioned bipartisan agreement allows for the well-kept secret that keeps the spending going. One side doesn't give up one penny on military spending. The other side doesn't give up one penny on welfare spending, while both sides support the bailouts and the subsidies for the banking and the corporate elite. And the spending continues as the economy weakens and the downward spiral continues. As the government continues fiddling around, our liberties and our wealth burn in the flames of a foreign policy that makes, makes us less safe. The major stumbling block to real change in Washington is the total resistance to admitting that the country is broke. This has made compromising just to agree to increase spending inevitable since neither side has any intention on cutting spending. The country and the Congress will remain divisive since there's no loot left to divvy up. Without this recognition, the spenders in Washington will continue to march toward a fiscal cliff much bigger than the one anticipated this coming January. I've thought a lot about why those of us who believe in liberty as a solution have done so poorly in convincing others of its benefits. If liberty is what we claim it is, the principle that protects all personal, social, and economic decisions necessary for maximum prosperity and the best chance for peace, it should be an easy sell. Yet history has shown that the masses have been quite receptive to the promises of authoritarians which are, are rarely, if ever, fulfilled. Should we have authoritarianism or liberty? If authoritarianism leads to poverty and war and less freedom for all individuals and is controlled by rich special interests, the people should be begging for liberty. There certainly was a strong enough sentiment for more freedom at the time of our founding. All right, let's stop there. Now, he explains and gives the numbers how mega banks get almost all the money and then give a tiny bit to the welfare recipients. He explains how it's the ultra-rich that are anti-free market against those of us that actually produce. The age of redistribution coming up. The only point that I would disagree with him on is one small point. I'll talk about that when we come back. Now it's the heart of the globalist F1 with all their hookers and crime syndicates flying helicopters around till 4 a.m. in the morning. I actually looked it up. <laughs> they fly them to restaurants and things. Unbelievable. All taxpayer paid for the stupid event. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, that's globalism for you. The ultra rich love big government because it takes your money. And as long as they give a few pennies on every dollar to the welfare queens, they'll pull the lever to take everything you got. Now, getting back to Ron Paul, he's about to break that down. Did you back it up about 10 seconds? Fantastic. Ron Paul's farewell speech. And again, he's going to be back on with us soon. He was on with us last week. Here's the deal. He says the American empire. And technically, yes, it's the U.S. It's the American empire. But the globalists brag how we're paying for it. We're getting the blame for the 160 countries we're in, all the wars. And our, our boys die. We pay for it. But we don't get the oil. We don't. All we get is the hatred. Oh, yeah, we don't get the Iraqi oil. We paid to take Iraq over, so Europe got it. It's the same thing. It'd be one thing if we were a corrupt, evil empire, but we actually got some of it like the British Empire. No, 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 no. You just pay for mega banks to have a government and an army to enforce what they want to do. So it's the globalist empire, and America is like a Hessian uh, uh, province, like Germany had a province that produced mercenaries. That's what the U.S. is. We're the testing ground for the Hollywood brainwashing and all of it. Let's go ahead and uh, go back to Congressman Ron Paul and his historic speech where he gets into the age of redistribution, authoritarians, authoritarianism versus liberty. Here it is. Authoritarianism or liberty. If authoritarianism leads to poverty and war and less freedom for all individuals and is controlled by rich special interests, the people should be begging for liberty. There certainly was a strong enough sentiment for more freedom at the time of our founding that motivated those who were willing to fight in the revolution against the powerful British government. 
During my time in Congress, the appetite for liberty has been quite weak. The understanding of its significance negligible. Yet the good news is that compared to 1976, when I first came to Congress, the desire for more freedom and less government in 2012 is much greater and growing, especially in grassroots America. Tens of thousands of teenagers and college-age students are, with great enthusiasm, welcoming the message of liberty. I have a few thoughts as to why the people of a country like ours, once the freest and most prosperous, allowed the conditions to deteriorate to the degree that they have. Freedom, private property, and enforceable voluntary contracts generate wealth. In our early history, we were very much aware of this. But the, in the early part of the 20th century, our politicians promoted the notion that the tax and monetary system had to change. If we were to involve ourselves in excessive domestic and military spending, that is why Congress gave us the Federal Reserve and the income tax. The majority of Americans and many government officials agreed that sacrificing some liberty was necessary to carry out what some claim to be progressive ideas. Pure democracy became acceptable. They failed to recognize that what they were doing was exactly opposite of what the colonists were seeking when they broke away from the British. Some complain that my arguments make no sense, since great wealth and the standard of living improved for many Americans over the last hundred years, even with these new policies. But the damage to the market economy and the currency has been insidious and steady. It took a long time to consume our wealth, destroy the currency, and undermine productivity and get our financial obligations to a point of no return. Confidence sometimes lasts longer than deserved. Most of our wealth today depends on debt. The wealth that we enjoyed and seemed to be endless allowed concern for the principle of a free society to be neglected. As long as most people believe the material abundance would last forever, worrying about protecting a competitive, productive economy and individual liberty seemed unnecessary. The age of redistribution. This neglect ushered in an age of redistribution of wealth by government, kowtowing to any and all special interests, except for those who just wanted to be left alone. That is why today, money in politics far surpasses money currently going into research and development and productive entrepreneurial efforts. The material benefits became more important than the understanding and promoting the principles of liberty and a free market. It is good that material abundance is a result of liberty, but materialism is all that we care if but if materialism is all that we care about, problems are guaranteed. The crisis arrived because the illusion that wealth and prosperity would last forever has ended. Since it was based on debt and a pretense that debt can be papered over by an out of control fiat monetary system, it was doomed to fail. We have ended up with a system that doesn't produce enough even to finance the debt and no fundamental understanding of why a free society is crucial to reversing these trends. If this is not recognized, the recovery will linger for a long time. Bigger government, more spending, more debt, more poverty for the middle class, and a more intense scramble by the elite special interests will continue. We need an intellectual awakening. Without an intellectual awakening, the turning point will be driven by economic law. Yeah, like the Formula the One scum. The dollar will bring the current out-of-control system to its knees. If it's not accepted that big government, fiat money, ignoring liberty, central economic planning, welfareism, and warfareism caused our crisis, we can expect a continuous and dangerous march toward corporatism and even fascism with even more loss of our liberties. Prosperity for a large middle class, though, will become an abstract dream. This continuous move is no different than what we have seen in how our financial crisis of 2008 was handled. Congress first directed, with bipartisan support, bailouts for the wealthy. 
Then it was the Federal Reserve with its endless quantitative easing. If at first it doesn't succeed, try again. QE1, QE2, QE3, and with no results, we try QE indefinitely. That is, until it too fails. There is a cost to all of this, and let me assure you, delaying the payment is no longer an option. The rules of the market will extract the pound, its pound of flesh, and it won't be pretty. The current crisis elicits a lot of pessimism, and the pessimism adds to less confidence in the future. The two feed on themselves, making our situation worse. If the underlying cause of the crisis is not understood, we cannot solve our problems. The issue of warfare and welfare, deficits, inflationism, and corporatism, bailouts, and authoritarianism cannot be ignored. By only expanding these policies, we cannot expect good results. Everyone claims support for freedom, but too often it's for one's own freedom and not for others. Too many believe that there must be limits on freedom. They are we're normally the heart of the resistance, but I bet money I could walk outside of my South Texas InfoWars campus command center. There'd be helicopters in the air with billionaire bankers with stolen derivative money, mile high with their hooker girlfriends and bimbos. Uh, I mean, literally, you walk outside, it's like eight, nine helicopters. At one time, Friday afternoon, I'm driving down the highway, and there's eight helicopters over me. And, and I went up on a mix master, and I could look all over Austin. There were just helicopters, like 40 of them, just swarming around everywhere <laughs> with stolen taxpayer money, most of it. Literally, go look at who's doing it. The whole stinking thing's paid for by taxpayers. Enough of that. It just really makes me angry. Uh, getting back to Ron Paul, we were busy listening to Ron Paul, and I was telling him a story. I'll tell it now since I'm on air. I mentioned it Friday, and my mother heard it of all people. Uh, and I'm not bragging that I'm some great guy. I'm, I love Aerosmith. Liked him since I was a kid. Aerosmith, uh, uh, quite a few of them are listeners, and Joe Perry dedicated his last solo album to me. Uh, you can look it up. I'm not bragging. It's just that it's a fact. And they invited me out to be backstage in front seat Formula One tickets so i'm busy telling john and and uh, wes and uh, dan out there yeah you know i bet the listeners think that i'm uh, you know just mad i'm not in the helicopters and mad that i'm not at formula one I, they'll never know and meanwhile ron paul goes to break so we uh, didn't have any music going out to break but i'm sure you'll survive and that's my point i've been at hollywood parties with the a-listers and it's nothing i want freedom that's what i'm lusting after I'm not bragging, hey, Alex Jones, I'm a big shot too. These globalist bankers, why do they have billions of stolen dollars and still want to prance around like peacocks? And I'm not knocking Aerosmith. I mean, they play music, they play to crowds, great music. I, I think that's fine. Crowds aren't bad. It's these globalist events. It's these globalist events we're talking about, and that's why I couldn't go to Formula One, because I just can't be around these New World Order people. If I'm behind the scenes in the front row boxes, and I see a Rothschild or a Rockefeller or royalty, British royalty, I didn't tell Aerosmith this, but I'm saying it now on the air so they'll hear it, their listeners. I can't control myself. So you know what? I leave. I was at a steakhouse and Carl Rove was there giggling and laughing and talking about lying to people for like an hour. He lives here in Austin. And I just got up and left. You know what? People are there to eat at the steakhouse. They don't want a distraction. I'm leaving. So that's it. Uh, let's go back to uh, Ron Paul and his historic farewell address. Then we'll come back with more Ron Paul. And then I will play our little F1 report that Jakari Jackson filed. Here it is. Some decide what and whose freedoms to be, limited, to be limited. These are the politicians whose goal in life is power. Their success depends on gaining support from special interests. We don't need more isms. The great news is the answer is not to be found in more isms. The answers are to be found in more liberty which costs so much less. Under these circumstances, spending goes down, wealth production goes up, and the quality of life improves. Just this recognition, especially if we move in this direction, increases optimism, which in itself is beneficial. The follow through with sound policies are required, which must be understood and supported by the people.
But there is good evidence that the generation coming of age at the present time is supportive of moving in the direction of more liberty and self-reliance. The more this change in direction and the solutions become known, the quicker will be our return to optimism. Our job for those of us who believe that a different system than the one that we have had had for the last hundred years has driven us to this unsustainable crisis is to be more convincing that there is a wonderful, uncomplicated, and moral system that provides the answers. We had a taste of it in our early history. We need not give up on the notion of advancing this cause. It worked but we allowed our leaders to concentrate on the material abundance that freedom generates while ignoring freedom itself. Now we have neither, but the door is open out of necessity for an answer. The answer available is based on the Constitution, individual liberty, and prohibiting the use of government force to provide privileges and benefits to all special interests. After over 100 years, we face a society quite different from the one that was intended by the founders. In many ways, their efforts to protect future generations with the Constitution from this danger has failed. Skeptics at the time of the Constitution was written in 1787, warned us of today's possible outcome. The insidious nature of the erosion of our liberties and the reassurance our great abundance gave us, allowed the process to evolve into a dangerous period in which we now live. Dependency on government largesse. Today, we face a dependency on government largesse for almost every need. Our liberties are restricted and government operates outside the rule of law, protecting and rewarding those who buy or coerce government into satisfying their demands. Here are a few examples. Undeclared wars are commonplace. Welfare for the rich and poor is considered an entitlement. The economy is overregulated, overtaxed, and grossly distorted by a deeply flawed monetary system. Debt is growing exponentially. The Patriot Act and FISA legislation passed without much debate have resulted in a steady erosion of our Fourth Amendment rights. Tragically, our government engages in preemptive war, otherwise known as aggression, with no complaints from the American people. The drone warfare we are pursuing worldwide is destined to end badly for us as the hatred builds for innocent lives lost and the international f laws flaunted. Once we are financially weakened and militarily challenged, there will be a lot of resentment thrown our way. It's now the law of the land that the military can arrest American citizens, hold them indefinitely without charges or a trial. Rampant hostility toward free trade is supported by a large number in Washington. Supporters of sanctions, currency manipulation, and WTO trade retaliation call the true free traders isolationists. Sanctions are used to punish countries that don't follow our orders. Bailouts and guarantees of all kind of misbehavior are routine. Central economic planning through monetary policy, regulations, and legislative mandates has been acceptable policy. I have a few questions. Excessive government has created such a mess, it prompts many questions. Why are sick people who, are, who use medical marijuana put in prison? Why does the federal government restrict the drinking of raw milk? Why can't American manufacturers manufacture rope and other products from hemp? Why are Americans not allowed to use gold and silver as legal tender as mandated by the Constitution? Why is Germany concerned enough to consider repatriating their gold held by the Fed for her in New York? Is it that the trust in the U.S. and dollar supremacy beginning to wane? Why do our political leaders believe it's necessary to thoroughly audit? Why do our political leaders believe it's unnecessary to thoroughly audit our own gold? Why can't Americans decide which type of light bulbs they can buy? Why is it the TSA permitted to abuse the rights of any American traveling by air? Why should there be mandatory sentences even up to life for crimes without victims as our drug laws require? 
Why have we allowed the federal government to regulate commodes in our homes? Why is it political suicide for anyone to criticize APAC? Why haven't we given up on the drug war since it's an obvious failure and violates the people's rights? All right, let's stop right there. Nobody knows We're going to go to break and come back with the rest of his wise, wise, wise. And he does ask, why is it political suicide to criticize APAC? Whether you love Israel or hate what Israel's doing, it is true that that is one of the few special interests that if you don't endorse them, they come after you. And I think that's wrong because APAC represents a foreign power. All right, when we get back, we'll continue with his why, 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 one of the most powerful parts of the speech. We've only gotten to like half of it. Uh, he gets into world government and how America's been hijacked and taken over in his conclusion. The full video is at Infowars.com. Stay with us. You know, the Ron Paul speech is 49 minutes long. It's going to be technical, 48 minutes, 51 seconds. And maybe on Thanksgiving, I'll air the whole thing. Or, or, or Friday. I think I'm taking off next Friday, too. But uh, you know, with the weekday show, because it's so important. But I want to play the whole thing, be able to analyze it, talk about it. We'll take two hours to cover his speech. We'll tape a show, an original show for Friday. I'm going to do that tomorrow after my show. I'm going to, after the weekday show, I'm going to, I'm going to take that. I'm going to tape a whole show for Friday, or at least two hours. It'll take two hours with all the breaks and my comments to air this whole Ron Paul speech. Because I got a, a whole bunch of other stuff I want to get to. But uh, here is Ron Paul continuing with why. Why does our country, the land of the free, home of the brave, do this? Why is it political suicide for anyone to criticize APAC? Why haven't we given up on the drug war since it's an obvious failure and violates the people's rights? Has nobody noticed that the authorities can't even keep drugs out of the prisons? How can making our entire society a prison solve the problem? Why do we sacrifice so much getting, ne getting necessarily involved in border disputes and civil strife around the world and ignore the root cause of the most dangerous, deadly border in the world, the one between Mexico and the United States. Why does Congress willingly give up its prerogatives to the executive branch? Why does changing the party in power never change policy? Could it be that the views of both parties are essentially the same? Why did the big banks, the large corporations, and foreign banks and foreign central banks get bailed out in 2008 and the middle class lost their jobs and their homes? Why do so many in the government and the federal officials uh, believe that creating money out of thin air creates wealth? Why do so many accept the deeply flawed principle that government bureaucrats and politicians can protect us from ourselves without totally destroying the principle of liberty? Why can't people understand that war always destroys wealth and liberty? Why is there no so little concern for the executive order that gives the president authority to establish a kill list, including American citizens, of those targeted for assassination? Why is patriotism thought to be blind loyalty to the government and the politicians who run it, rather than loyalty to the principles of liberty and support for the people? Real patriotism is a willingness to challenge the government when it's wrong. Amen. Why is it claimed that if people won't or can't take care of their own needs, that people in government are able to do it for them? Why did we ever give the government a safe haven for initiating violence against the people? Why do so many members defend free markets but not civil liberties? Why do so many members defend civil liberties but not free markets? Aren't they the same? Why don't more defend both economic liberty and personal liberty? Why are there not more individuals who seek to intellectually influence others to bring about positive changes those who seek power uh, changes than those who seek power to force others to obey their commands. Why does the use of religion to support a social gospel and preemptive wars, both of which require authoritarians to use violence or the threat of violence, go unchallenged? Aggression and forced redistribution of wealth has nothing to do with the teachings of the world's great religions. Why do we allow the government and the Federal Reserve to disseminate false information dealing with both economic and foreign policy? Why is democracy held in such high esteem when 
it's the enemy, when it's the enemy of the minority and makes all rights relative to the dictates of the majority. Why should anyone be surprised that Congress has no credibility since there's such a disconnect between what politicians say and what they do? Is there any explanation for all the deception, the unhappiness, the fear of the future, the loss of confidence in our leaders, the distrust and the anger and frustration? Yes, there is. And there's a way to reverse these attitudes. The negative perceptions are logical and a consequence of bad policies bringing about our problems. Identification of the problems and recognizing the cause allow the proper changes to come easily. We should have more trust in ourselves, less in the government. Too many people have far, for too, far too long placed too much confidence and trust in government and not enough in themselves. Fortunately, many are now becoming aware of the seriousness of the gross mistakes of the past several decades. The blame is shared by both political parties. Many Americans now are demanding to hear the plain truth of thing, things and want the demagoguing to stop. Without this first step, solutions are impossible. Seeking the truth and finding the answers in liberty and self-reliance promotes the optimism necessary for restoring prosperity. The task is not that difficult if politics doesn't get in the way. That's right. We have allowed ourselves to get into such a mess for various reasons. All right. Politics. I will air the entire speech with my commentary coming up during the week. We aired about half of it or close to half of it. Uh, look. I want to do a whole piece with Ron Paul's speech showing video and articles over everything he talks about so people can see illustrated with images what he's talking about backed up. And I was talking to a Ron Paul insider just a few days ago and he was telling me about three big things Ron Paul's going to do as soon as he's out of the Congress, which is in the next month. Uh, and it's going to be very, very exciting. I'll just leave it, leave it at that. But... Uh, Certainly going to be big news when it comes out. But I would say this, you know, he calls the drug war a failure. And I know Ron Paul's been on the show. He's given speeches saying the CIA brings in most of the drugs. It's not a failure. We have the largest prison population in the world. They made the drugs illegal to keep the price up. They arrest the low-level dealers, but the users go out and rob houses, sell their bodies, you name it, to be able to pay 100 times what the drug should cost to attain it. It's just criminal business people that figured out by making things illegal, they can make larger profits off of it. So decriminalize now, that will shut all this down. Uh, why torture? You know, why are we saying torture is good, but we can't trust North Korea because they torture? Uh, why is the government spending $20 billion a year plus, admittedly, paying to put anti-gun, anti-family, pro-Obamacare messages in the media. If you didn't know that, if you wonder why every sitcom or drama has anti-gun, anti-male, pro-socialism, pro-abortion messages, your tax money pays for that. You're being brainwashed by state-run media. And he calls it state-run media, but I wanted to flesh out what Ron Paul meant by state-run media run by authoritarian psychopaths. He says that in the speech coming up. Uh, also, why is CPS, according to the Justice Department's own numbers, Child Protective Services, five to seven times more likely to physically or sexually abuse kids? Why aren't they under scrutiny for that? Well, they're the government, of course. We roll over and think government's God in America today. We think the American virtue is groveling to uniforms, groveling to bureaucrats, groveling to weird people with crazed looks on their faces who can't wait to grab our kids and take them to some dungeon and rape them. I mean, that's what we've become. Why is our government funding Al-Qaeda? I mean, it's in the L.A. Times and dozens of other papers that the CFR two months ago, big globalist group that runs America, said, the, the Bilderberg regional government, said, we need Al-Qaeda, we're going to use them against all these Shiite and secular Muslim countries. Our government is putting Al-Qaeda in to wreck these countries while using the threat of Al-Qaeda to take our rights. Again, I've said that five times tonight, but it's such a big deal. Why is the bankster occupational government funding Al-Qaeda? I'm against Al-Qaeda, and if you say I'm unpatriotic for not loving Al-Qaeda, then you can go to Hades. I'm done. I see through the globalists. It isn't hard. 
And why are we letting the globalists get us into deeper and deeper debt and signing us on to their derivatives? Iceland said no two years ago, and they arrested the banksters and found out 92% of the debt was not the country's debt. It, their government ministers had signed them on to foreign debt that wasn't theirs. But again, the globalists created this fiat debt to sign us on to it. That's why they want to bankrupt us. That's why they want, that's why they doubled the number of people on food stamps the last four years. They want a dependent, lazy mass that loves the television, loves the media, and thinks Barack Obama's their friend when Barack Obama is a projection, a hologram, a front man, a globalist, a puppet. I will cover all this and more throughout the weekday show, 12 noon to 3 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Central. If you don't have a local AM or FM in your area, we're over 140 affiliates now, XM 166. You can always listen to the free podcast at Infowars.com and watch the free video feeds uh, that get posted on YouTube or subscribe and see it all live at InfoWarsNews.com. You can also subscribe and get our magazine and give it as a gift. Great job, crew. See you back tomorrow, Lord willing.